Introducing Carvana Value Tracker, where you can track your car's value over time and learn what's driving it. It might make you excited. Whoa, didn't know my car was valued this high. It might make you nervous. Uh-oh, market's flooded. My car's value just dipped 2.3%. It might make you optimistic. Our low mileage is paying off. Our value's up. And it might make you realistic. Mm, car prices haven't gone up in a couple weeks. Maybe it's time to sell. But it will definitely make you an expert on your car's value. Carvana Value Tracker. Visit Carvana.com to start tracking your car's value today. Hello again, Andrew Dunkley here, the host of Space Nuts. Hope you're well and Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. This will be our last show for 2022. I think we're going to put in some of our favourite episodes to cover the gap between now and uh, our next real episode. We've got a lot to talk about today and a um, an enigma involving our Milky Way galaxy has been solved. So we'll tell you all, all about that and there may be a solution to the dark matter problem, maybe. If we can figure out what we're talking about, you might understand what we're talking about too. Plus audience questions and we have got a little Christmas surprise for you right at the end. So uh, I'm not going to give too much away, but I I want to send a shout out to Paul and say thank you for um, sending it through and I hope you don't mind if we embarrass the almighty hell out of you, Paul. That's all coming up on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9... Ignition sequence start. Space nuts. Five, four, three, two. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And we're joined, as always, by his good self, astronomer at large, Professor Fred Watson. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. Fancy seeing you here. Yes, it's odd, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's good I'm to sure see you. people. Sure, people tune in thinking it's going to be someone different every week. <laughs> No, we, we're disappointingly always the same, really, aren't we? We're very regular. Yeah. I, um, yeah we eat a lot of fibre. I've been um, spending some time this past week trying to uh, look into the details of the former Australian Astronomical Observatory Library, which has been oh. sadly orphaned for a number of years because libraries are not what they used to be. And so I've spent a lot of time in the bowels of this library. And one of the things I found was this book, which I'll hold up. I don't know whether you can read that. It is it is one of the memoirs of the British Astronomical Association called Artificial Earth Satellites. Oh. And it was published in 1961. The reason why I brought it home is because it's got pictures of people that I knew and worked with when they were very young back in 1961 but what what's really interesting about it is the you know there's all this excitement about observing these artificial satellites which i think when this was published numbered 4 in number <laughs> <laughs> so they were i think they would have been a bit astonished to look mm. forward all these decades actually one of them i think is still around i think uh, one of my friends from the royal observatory in edinburgh is still probably doing this sort of stuff to see you know we've got six thousand operational satellites in orbit yeah. and probably many more that are defunct yeah well there are the um, there have been two thousand satellite launches this year it, alone it's astonishing isn't it that's right yeah and most of those have been spacex starlink satellites mm, exactly so, yeah. and of course amazon's going to get into it yep Next year, yep, so that's right. Gosh, yep. Um, we'll soon be able to walk around the planet up there. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Just yeah. Satellite hop from one to another. Easy peasy. Easy peasy. Mm. That's right. Okay, let's uh, get down to it. And one of uh, our galaxy's unsolved mysteries is no longer unsolved, and that is to do with the small satellite galaxies that are nearby and. The problem has been for decades they've gone, hang on, this just doesn't add up and it doesn't uh, you know, fit in with the cosmological model and what is going on here, they've, um, they've found the answer. Apparently they have. These are scientists in a number of universities, including uh, the University of Durham in the north of England and the University of Helsinki in Finland. You're right, this is a more a cosmological problem than a galaxy evolution problem. By cosmology, I mean the you know, the evolution and origin of the universe as a whole. Uh, So when you model the cosmic web, which is what we think the structure of the universe is like on very large scales, this sort of honeycomb formed by galaxies and sheets of galaxies at the end, when you model that and look at the way galaxies evolve within that structure, you would expect the satellite galaxies that are formed around big galaxies like our own, and our own Milky Way has 
quite a large number of satellite galaxies, of which the two brightest and, and uh, biggest are the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds, which we see mm. from down here in the Southern Hemisphere. Mm. But when, when you when you do the modelling, you expect these satellite galaxies to be sort of swarming around their, you know, what you might call their parent galaxies in, uh, in, in a roughly spherical kind of swarm. But it's not like that with our Milky Way galaxy, um, because these smaller galaxies basically have an alignment they they seem to sit in a plane rather than in a, in a sphere of material so if you imagine a a disk of these galaxies going around our own galaxy um, oh like the like the rings of saturn yeah, type exa- scenario that's exactly right that's a good a- mm. analog i was struggling to find one but you've hit on <laughs> a very good one there because the, mm. the rings of saturn are made of individual particles and you might wonder why they're not just spread around in a sphere around saturn but they're not they're in a you know a blade like plane which yeah. comes about because of saturn's gravitational pull uh, but the same is true in our own galaxy and in fact, we know that the two Magellanic clouds being pulled apart by tidal forces exerted on them by the Milky Way galaxy, but they do both lie effectively in this plane. Um, and there's a string of material called the, the Magellanic, what's it called? Not the Magellanic Bridge, something like that. Magellanic Stream, stream of material that's being torn off them that also sits in this plane. And so um, what has been a problem for cosmologists has been looked at in detail by these astronomers. And as I mentioned, one of them is Professor Carlos Frank, who I worked with many, many years ago when I used to be an astronomer in the UK. In fact, he once offered me a job, (laughs) which I don't think he was entitled to do, but he, let me put it this way, he encouraged me very strongly to apply for it because they couldn't find anybody else. So, so, don't you love don't you love job offers like that? Yeah. Will, will you apply for this job? No one else will. <laughs> was exactly what it was. That was exactly the way the conversation went. Actually, oh, I, Carlos, uh, as you might expect from his name, is a very uh, striking gentleman of Latin American origin, and um, I I once uh, was in the BA lounge, I think, in Heathrow Airport, and I. I, th- I saw this gentleman who was the image of Carlos. And I went up to him and said, hello, Carlos, how are you doing? I haven't seen you for years. And he had no idea what I was talking about <laughs> and said, uh, my name's Frank or something, you know, or George. I can't remember. But the penny dropped really for me after he sort of shooed me away thinking, oh, he's this loony. When I realised that this guy looked like Carlos Frank did the last time I saw him, twenty years earlier. Oh, right! <laughs> Isn't it funny how your brain does that? Yeah, my brain hadn't updated my mental no. image of Carlos. Yeah. So, and if you're listening to this, Carlos, hello. I hope I'm reporting your work accurately. Because whatever you look like, yes. To cut to the chase, Carlos and his colleagues have essentially discovered that. The disk-like formation of these satellites, and I should add that you see this in other galaxies as well, not just just in our own, something that uh, sort of happens almost automatically when you run your simulations very accurately. And and it's, it's something to do with the distances of these satellites from the center of the, of the galaxy. And I guess what they were perhaps doing is putting them all at the same distance, which would make your satellite look like a a sphere of stuff Mm. around. Whereas if you put them at their differing distances, then the interactions between them, the gravitational interactions between them and with the galaxy tends to pull them into a disk. So it's a kind of natural consequence of this, uh, you know, of this, um, arrangement of satellites that has been seen as a mystery before as as the phys.org article says describing this there's no known physical mechanism that would make satellites planes and so they should be in a round configuration but it's by putting in this additional ingredient into the mix when you do the the analysis of the simulations of this. And I have to say, Carlos is one of the great leaders in in the world in doing cosmological simulations. They've got essentially a model universe in their computers in the University of Durham there. So they can test all these things. But yeah, it turns out that 
it's effectively a chance alignment which comes and goes. And in fact, um, Carlos, there's a nice quote from Carlos here. He said, the strange alignment of the Milky Way satellite galaxies in the sky had perplexed astronomers for decades, so much so that it was deemed to pose a profound challenge to cosmological orthodoxy. In other words, have we got it all wrong? Um, But thanks to the amazing data from the Gaia satellite, so that's another thing that's gone into the mix here, and the laws of physics, we now know that the plane is just a chance alignment, a matter of being in the right place at the right time, just as the constellations of stars in the sky are. Come back in a billion years and that plane will have disintegrated, as will today's constellations. We have Ah. been able to remove one of the main outstanding challenges to the cold dark matter theory of the universe. It continues to provide a remarkably faithful description of the evolution of our universe. Yeah, it's uh, very nice stuff. So what he's basically saying is what we're seeing is unusual but also normal, and it will sort itself out. Yes, that's right, and it happens kind of everywhere. Yeah. It's one of the things that maybe you could think of as a, a natural consequence of the evolution of galaxies. When you put them into the context of the, the galaxies that surrounding that surround them, you know, when you study galaxies, you've really got to think of them in their in their environment rather than individually, because that definitely affects the way the gas motions behave within the galaxies and star formation takes place and things of that sort. I've got many colleagues here in Australia who work on this topic, and I'm all, my mind is always blown by the details of what goes on, you know, yeah. the feedback mechanisms that are present in the evolution of galaxies. It's fabulous stuff. Yeah. Which I Isn't don't it understand. It's great to be able to just you know, find a story that says, okay, this was weird, but now we think it's just normal. So, you know, let's not worry about it anymore. It's all solved. Yeah, that's right. It doesn't happen often. Yeah. You can bet your life somebody will come along next month and, and knock say, it on the head. Uh, but I'll say, but, ah, but have you thought of... <laughs> <laughs> yes, there'll probably be almost. There'll probably be a Space Nuts listener as well. <laughs> yeah, almost, almost guaranteed. Almost guaranteed. <laughs> that's right. Yes. Uh, but if you want to read that story, it's on the phys.org website. It's currently on astronomydaily.io if you want to rip in there and have a look at it as well, along with all the other stories that pop up there. Uh, this is Space Nuts, our last episode of the season. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Let's take a quick break from the show to tell you about our sponsor, NordVPN. Now, I've told you many times about the value of having a virtual private network to protect you. When you're out in the field, whether it's public Wi-Fi or on a train or in a a railway station, uh, whether you're at an airport, anywhere where there's uh, public Wi-Fi, you are exposed. And not only that, you're exposed at home if you go to websites without using a virtual private network and hackers can get into your private data. And they just want your money. That's what they want. Or personal information, identity theft, it's all... Fairly easy these days if you do not protect yourself. So there's a special URL that you can log on to as a Space Nuts listener that will give you an exclusive deal. It's nordvpn.com slash space nuts. And then uh, you'll see that there's a, a, a very good deal at the moment for Christmas, four extra months for free, along with their 30-day money-back guarantee. So click on Get the Deal and you'll see the plans. There's a monthly plan, a one-year plan, a two-year plan with all sorts of combinations from high-speed VPN, which comes with uh, all their levels of service. You can also get malware protection, tracker and ad blocker protection. That's at the uh, minimum level. Uh, If you go up one more level, you can get cross-platform password management and data breach scanning. And if you buy the whole package, you also get a terabyte of encrypted cloud storage. Now, I've tested NordVPN in the field. I know it works, it's fast, and it gives you security. Even if you don't think you're in in danger, it's always good just to put that extra layer of protection in, and it covers a multitude of devices. So check them out today, nordvpn.com slash space nuts, our sponsor, and see what they can do for you. I'm sure you'll be satisfied. Now, back to the show. Space nuts. Now to another um, mysterious thing in the universe that has defied logic and certainly defied our attempts to resolve, and that is dark matter. But now they may have, again, found a solution. There's been all sorts of theories pitched as to what dark matter could be or why it exists or how it exists. This is another one, but this one sounds like it holds water. 
Or light, <laughs> as the case may be. Or dark. Or dark. Dark <laughs> yeah. light. Dark light, that's right. Um, yeah, it, it, so just recapping briefly, of course, the dark matter problem is one that occupies the minds of most astrophysicists and cosmologists, that we we see evidence everywhere and not just in the rotation of galaxies, but that's one well-known example. We see evidence everywhere that there is some constituent of the universe that has gravitational attraction, but nothing else. It doesn't interact in any other way with the with the contents of the universe. So it's being identified as some species or set of species of subatomic particles that mm. have mass but don't interact in any other way, and which are fundamental in actually creating the framework within which galaxies formed and stars and planets and ultimately human beings. So it's very important and very embarrassing that astronomers don't actually know what it is. Uh, So this is a a new tack, at least it's new to me. I haven't come across this work before or this suggestion. There's a large number of uh, institutions involved in this research, including the International School of Advanced Studies, whose press release I'm reading, uh, but they've also collaborated with astronomers in Tel Aviv, Nottingham, UK, and New York, where there is a lot of interest in this topic. So um, it goes back to observations, and it's always nice when you find a new theory or a new idea that's linked directly with observations. And the Hubble Space Telescope has on board something called the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph. And that basically uh, looks at the structure of the cosmic web. This is this network of filaments of galaxies that, that there is, and spaces in between, the kind of honeycomb structure that I mentioned a few minutes ago. So yeah. when you look at the these data, uh, I think we talked about these filaments a few months ago with the idea that some of them are actually rotating. I don't know whether you remember that, but we, we, yeah, we, I do. we featured uh, rotating filaments in Space Nuts. That links so that the fact that you can observe the behavior of these filaments in some detail um, comes down to some another detail that has been observed by these scientists, which is that when you look at the data from the cosmic origin spectrograph, you find that these filaments are hotter than they are predicted to be by models built on the sort of standard model of galactic structure formation or universe structure formation. Now, by hotter, Scientists or physicists certainly usually mean more active in terms of the speed of the atoms that are that are making them up, the filaments. So if you remember, temperature is just a, a measure, certainly here on Earth. It's a measure of, of the rapidity of the motion of atoms in a, for example, in a in a lump of something or the way, you know, the way water boils you can sort of envisage when you look in a boiling pot of water that the atoms are moving around quite a lot so that yes. it's the motion of the atoms that is signifies the temperature and i think what they're saying here is that these filaments contain subatomic particles probably that that are in much more rapid motion than you might expect in other words they are they are hotter mm. in that sort of sense and there there is a way out of this issue uh, if you postulate that dark matter has multiple constituents a bit like normal matter has you know when we think of all the the, the zoo of particles that that make up normal matter maybe dark matter is like that as well and one of the constituents that they postulate is dark photons uh, which may actually have heated up the universe in its early stages dark photons being a dark matter equivalent of of bright photons if i can put it that way i'm going to make read a quote from one of the authors uh, andrea caputo who's at cern which of course is a good place to to think about subatomic particles sure and is tel aviv university andrea says dark photons are hypothetical new particles that are the force carriers for a new force in the dark sector, much like the photon is the force carrier for 
electromagnetism. So we think of photons as being particles of light, but they're actually the force carrier for, for magnetism as well. I beg your pardon, that's a quote from, uh, actually, it's, it's several of the authors, so it's, it's as you'd expect, because this is in a press release. It includes yeah. you know, James Bolton of the University of Nottingham, as well as others. Anyway, the comment that they go on to say is, unlike the photon, these dark photons can have mass. In particular, the ultralight dark photon, with a mass as small as 20 orders of magnitude less than that of the electron, this is vanishingly small, Andrew, is yeah. a good candidate for dark matter. And so what they're suggesting is that the dark photons and the normal photons sort of expected to mix in, in an analogue of the way different sorts of neutrinos mix. And what they're suggesting is that dark photon, dark matter might be converted into low frequency photons that might heat up the cosmic web. And that's why you get these hot filaments. But it's something that you can't really observe because it involves dark matter. So yeah. it's a complicated story. It is. I, I read the entire article in phys.org and, I, and I, I think I'd have to read it three or four times to wrap my head around it. And even then I might find that I'm coming up short. But as you said, it's, this is a theory. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> The thing about theories is you've then got to be able to come up with ways of trying to prove your theory correct. How would you do that in this case? Well, so that this is a start by uh, what, what the, the plan is, in a sense, is to use the whole universe as what we call a calorimeter, something that me measures the amount of heat. And if you can find that there's more heat in the universe than you think there should be from yeah. the standard model, then you know there's something missing. And these scientists are postulating that is the effect of these dark photons, the, the, the fact that it's mixing with the normal photons and producing what turns out to be the energy required, as it quotes in the uh, phys.org, sorry, quoting again the phys.org article, what you get is the energy required to reconcile the discrepancy between observations and simulation. And so... They suggest that this will actually drive more theoretical and observational in investigations in order to explore the exciting possibility that the dark photon could constitute, could constitute the dark matter. Now, I'm a bit puzzled by this, Andrew, as you might have guessed. Oh, good, good, because <laughs> yeah. I certainly am. I mean, the, we've, we've kind of gone along, and, I, and I'm not a particle physicist, so I, I flounder with some of this stuff, but we've basically uh, assumed that whatever dark matter particles are, they are more massive than their standard matter counterparts, like anti-neutrino or neutralinos, they're called, not anti-neutrinos. Neutralinos are thought to be one possibility for dark matter neutrinos. Uh, but so you expect them to be heavier or to be more massive than their normal matter counterparts because dark matter makes up, what is it, five-sixths of the, of the matter in the universe. It outweighs normal matter by five to one. And yeah. so you think they're, they're heavy, but we're hearing here that dark photons are very small or in terms of their mass, a mass as small as 20 orders of magnitude, less than that of the electron. So um, maybe there's just squillions just, more just of them. Just squillions more of them. That's really the only thing you can assume from that. But yeah, yeah it, isn't it an interesting insight, the idea that there might be dark photons which, uh, which make up some yes. of the mass in the universe? And I, I'm can, I, can I throw in a curveball? Yes, please do. I read an article yesterday that said that they are puzzled by a discovery that there is more light in the universe than there should be, and they can't account for it. Seeing that one, yeah, yeah. could that yeah. you know? Could we put these two lots together and say, oh, oh, could join be. the dots? Well, that could be the uh, the 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 Dunkley the smoking theory. gun, the smoking Dunkley theory. Uh, because uh, no, that just goes up in flames. <laughs> yeah, like lithium batteries, apparently. Yes. <laughs> so yes, um, yeah, you can be sure that there'll be scientists who who whose minds are across all this stuff in a way that certainly mine isn't. <laughs> Yours might be, yeah. but mine isn't. We'll yeah, we'll actually um, we'll we'll actually put the join the dots, and we may yeah, there may be more, there may be more stuff on this soon, which would be great. It's such a you know, I think this in itself is a curveball. Something dark photons coming in from 
nowhere is a, certainly a new idea to me, and I think mm. it's quite quite exciting. Yeah, it is, and it's got to be something. I mean, it's got to be something. That's, that's such, right. Such an obvious statement. So coming up with uh, fresh ideas, maybe something out of left field like this, is worth investigating. And uh, yeah, the dark. If it does correlate with the extra light in the universe, it's unaccounted for. You know, no. I'll, I'll happily fly wherever I need to fly to get my Nobel Prize. <laughs> uh, well, don't forget Let's your friends. Let's put it on record now. Don't forget your friends when you do. <laughs> I won't. No, you can. You can come. It'll be too heavy for just me. You can. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, that would be good. I, I think that would be a very satisfactory outcome from the Space Nuts if you got a Nobel Prize. Yeah, absolutely, it? yeah. It might double our audience to two listeners. <laughs> it's always a possibility. It, it is indeed. Yeah. But once again, if you'd like to look at that story, uh, it's on phys.org under the headline, Scientists Find New Hints That Dark Matter Could Be Made Up of Dark Photons. So, uh, yeah, check that one out. It is really fascinating. So it's a tough read, but not only for me, I think you'll find it quite <laughs> no, easy. It's, it's tough. <laughs> this is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Okay, we checked all four systems. Uh, with a go. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, to what is always our favourite part of the show, and that is sharing it with the audience and getting them to contribute via questions. Uh, we're going to do a few questions, and we've got plenty of time, which is good, uh, <laughs> but we're also going to throw in a bit of a curveball um, from from Paul, who's sent in something Christmassy for us. I think he did something similar last year or, you know, sometime in the past, but it might not have been Christmas, but uh, got a recollection that he did something. Uh, so let's firstly go to a question from William. Hey, Andrew and Fred. This is William from Toronto, Canada. I have a question about radio waves and Bluetooth. If I'm wearing a Bluetooth earbud that's no more than two centimeters across, how is it able to pick up and send radio wave frequencies if it's so small and radio wave wavelengths are so large? Thank you. Wow. Well, I, I never even considered that. Yeah, they're about two centimetres. Yeah. Which is, you know, what a, just shy of an inch. It is. For people who is. live in countries that, where they don't four, know four how to properly measure things. Four fifths of an inch. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's a good question. It is a good question. And isn't Bluetooth fantastic? It is. Oh, makes, Australian invention, wasn't it? Uh, that was Wi Fi. No, no Wi Fi. Yeah. Wi Fi was. I think yeah. um, Bluetooth. If I remember, comes from Finland. Yeah, it was named and named after a Viking. That's right. Yes, named, yes. Whose name was Bluetooth? Bluetooth. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So mm. yeah, it is incredible. Uh, so I think, I mean, William's question is a great one because we think of, um, you know, antennas uh, like the stuff that's on the roof of your house. If you still got one on the roof of your house, with I have. with the uh, with the dipoles, the um, you know, the basically the bits of metal that sense the, the radio frequency waves. I'm used to seeing things like that. And in fact, that's actually quite a good analogue because the UHF band, which is what ultra high frequency it stands for, that's what these TV things usually are, typically, is the, is the band of the Bluetooth network. It's uh, frequencies from 2.402 to 2.48 gigahertz, which is the same sort of wave band. It did a quick calculation in my head before we started talking. And I think that means they've got a wavelength around 10 centimetres or thereabouts, a bit more perhaps, but something along those lines. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, that does not, though, necessarily mean that you need a 10 centimetre long antenna to detect them, because you only need an antenna that is smaller than that wavelength so that it can actually pick up the variations in the field strength, the electrical field strength, or electromagnetic field strength, to do it, put it correctly, that is happening as these waves wash over you, if I can put it that way. So it's yeah. like having, you know, a buoy, or I think in Canada it's called a buoy, actually. So since we're talking to Toronto, my wife lived in Canberra for a long time and she always calls them buoys. Mm. So a buoy which was British expression, of course, and Australian, I think, yeah. uh, floating on the ocean. Uh, do you think of it, when, when a wave goes past, that goes up and down. And so it's a similar situation with the antenna of your Bluetooth device. It's just sensing the variation in electromagnetic field strength as the radio frequency waves go past. There you go. It would be more of a problem if your 
Bluetooth device was bigger than the wavelength of the of the signal that you're looking for, because then I think it would start to fall over. Yeah, interesting. I just had a thought. Uh, if you could flick a switch on the side of your head and turn your eyes into, um, you know, give them the ability to see all the radio waves that were being emitted at the moment. Oh, yeah. Would, would you basically be looking like you're being attacked by a spirograph? Like would you just see squiggles in all directions all the time? Yeah, you would. I mean, yeah, you'd be, it would be like being immersed in the ocean with waves of different frequencies going past you in different directions. I mean, it would be, it would be extraordinary to be able to do that. I think it yeah. might drive you slightly mad though. I reckon it might, <laughs> yeah. 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 Certainly affect your driving. Well, yes, if mm. you could see all that while you were driving, yeah, that would be terrible. You would see all the Bluetooth coming out of your radio and all the rest of it, yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you, William. Let's move on to our next question. I like this one. This comes from David. Hello, Fred and Andrew. This is David from San Marcos, Texas. Go Bobcats. <laughs> uh, quick question. I was watching a documentary on the Saturn's moon Mimas and the impact crater on it, which was approximately 130 kilometers across. And it showed a computer representation of the impact and it showed a wave of dust cloud going across the surface, but also showed a lot of fiery red soot and ash and even fire in the cloud. Um, I was wondering how was that able to light on fire or cause sparks like that in space when there is no oxygen? Um, confused me by watching it. Uh, love the show, guys. Uh, Merry Christmas and salutations to any aliens out there listening. <laughs> Thank you, David. Uh, your question impresses me. I'm even more impressed that you referred to kilometres. Uh, that, yeah, wow. Uh, but um, I, my first thought is, does Mimas have an atmosphere? Could that account for it? It's um, too small, Andrew. It, it doesn't, ah. doesn't have an atmosphere. Because there are squillions of moons in that yeah, vicinity, that's aren't right, Yeah, it's one of the bigger ones. And it's the one... It's really extraordinary. I can't remember what the crater's called, actually, which is terrible. But I'll look it up. Uh, yeah, it's a bit like um, Mars's moon Phobos has a crater. Oh, yeah. Uh, which I can remember its name. It's Stickney, it's called. And that is kind of takes up half the half of one hemisphere of Phobos. And Mimas or Mimas is, is much the same. It's got this enormous dent in it. It's the image of the Death Star from, from Star Wars. You, you're going to kick yourself. It's called Herschel Crater. Oh, that's it, Herschel, yeah. yeah. What a good name. <laughs> I think it's got an, another name in brackets, Mimantian Crater. There you go. That's, mm. yeah. Anyway, it's it's a big crater, and yes, it would have been formed by an impact, as was Stickney on uh, Phobos. But maybe that's a good question because, um, you know, in a sense, I guess what I'd point towards is although it's slightly different, but it's got similar overtones. The fact that the sun is shining very brilliantly, looking like a fiery ball, and yet there's no oxygen around it. Mm. And so what you're talking about is just gas that is heated to such a high temperature that it becomes luminous itself. So it's like, so they are flames, but they're flames that are kind of, you know, they cause differently from the oxygen reactions that give rise to flames on Earth. This is just stuff that's been heated, superheated, actually, by the energy of the impact. And essentially, the rock is vaporized. And because it's pushed up to such a high temperature, uh, that vapor is excited to, to, you know, to be luminous. A bit like the photosphere of the sun is, is luminous. It's Hot hydrogen is what you're seeing there when you when you look at the sun's surface. Yeah. Okay. So it's just a, a factor of heat. Yeah. Uh, slightly more technical. We call it black body radiation. So any object that has a temperature radiates electromagnetic waves. We do, actually. You and I, as we're sitting here, we're radiating in the infrared wave band, if I remember rightly, with a wavelength of about 10 microns. Uh, okay. 10 thousandths of a millimetre, hmm. 10 millionths of a... There you go. 10 millionths of a... 10 millionths <laughs> of a metre. Let me get it right. <laughs> so, but, yeah, but what I was going to say was if you take any body, any object, and that includes a cloud of gas, and heat it so that its black body spectrum shifts into the visible, it's akin to, 
you know, a red hot poker. It's red while it's at reasonably high temperatures, but you put it in and heat it up even more, it becomes white hot. Yeah. And that's sort of what's happening to the gas. It's black body radiation from the gas. Okay. There you go, David. Simple answer, really. <laughs> Which is not common in this segment. No, but anyway. no. In fact, <laughs> any answer at all isn't common in this segment. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, thank you, David. And uh, go to Bobcats. Yes. Uh, now, um, let's go to our next question. Uh, the uh, questioner needs no introduction. Hello, Space Nuts. Martin Berman Gorvine here, your favorite science fiction writer pest. Let me be the first to ask you what the reported breakthrough in nuclear fusion might mean for space travel. Since Fred poured cold heavy water (laughs) all over the idea of bussard ramjets for interstellar travel, what are the chances of fusion-powered interplanetary travel where the spaceship carries the hydrogen fuel with it instead of scooping it up from the thin interstellar medium like Robert Bussard proposed? becoming possible within a generation or so. Come on, man. I want to buy my ticket to Europa <laughs> at least by the time I'm Shatner's age. <laughs> Berman Gorvine, over and out. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Yeah, we did tip a bit of water on his uh, Azad Ramjet idea. Uh, and the other day we talked about the uh, successful experiment to create uh, fusion power using a laser. So more power is created than energy used to create the power. Uh, so that's got Martin thinking, well, why can't we go with fusion motors? Uh, I like the I – like, well, I always like Martin's thinking. <laughs> <laughs> it's outside the box. Yeah, it's outside the box. Um, so – the way I think I'd gravitate towards this idea, and yes, it's certainly something that might be applicable to interstar- interplanetary travel, is to, we don't know how big a useful fusion reactor is going to turn out to be when they start really fabricating them in such a way that you can get more energy out properly than you can put in. Yep. The um, the one that we reported on the other day is it's a tiny pallet of material that it that it focuses these and i can't remember how many lasers 30 or something lasers onto it which take a lot of power themselves to convert it to, to the energy that's required to, to create the fusion it's deuterium and tritium i think that the um, fusion pallet was made of anyway if you feel limited by you know, the fact that you've got really big stuff that needs to be the size of a power station on Earth in order to make your fusion electricity. I think what you might think about doing is using solar sails powered by ground-based lasers or something of that sort, which would mm. be blown along by the laser light created itself by fusion energy, so very cheap energy to blow along your spacecraft. If you can make them small enough, yeah, you could, could have a little power source in your in your uh what's it called xenon plasma rocket yeah so you know so you, you squirt out a plasma out of the back and accelerate it to enormous energies because of the uh because of the cheap power that you've got in space though you've also got solar power which is pretty cheap too yeah. and so that might not be competitive uh, yeah look i hope you'll be less than shatner's age before you get your ticket to europa that, the- that could be hard for Martin because I think that's next week. But anyway, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> yeah, certainly pretty near for me. <laughs> so I'm not going to be putting my name down just quite yet until there's a bit more certainty about it all. Yeah, mm-hmm. thanks for the question again, Martin. Always good to hear from you. Indeed it is. And uh, thanks for – Martin sent me another book. Oh, did um, he? Ah, oh, yeah. Yes, oh, yes. yes. This one is called The Long Morning of Heartwood. Now, I think it's a short story because it's – it's only it's a thin book. You know, it's a very thin book. I don't know how he got it published with 25 pages, but there it is. Ooh, I love it. So uh, I haven't started that yet because I've got to finish his other one, which I'm getting around to. I'm reading so many at once. It's not a very good idea. should read one then go to the next, but <laughs> I've got three on the go at the moment. Uh, now I've got four. Yeah, well, but, that's right, yeah. Yeah. Yes, but we're we're going on holiday, so I'll I'll take them with me. And then I hope no, we'll have a formal review of them from uh, Oh, for Space sure. Notes. Yes. Yes, I'm happy to do that. Mm. And I'm still reading Obi's book about uh, the future of space travel, so um, I'll, I'll do a review on that. I've actually already done a review on Amazon for him. So, Oh, great. Uh, well done. Mm. 
Now, there is one more thing before we uh, conclude. My apologies for ducking off screen all the time. I, I've um, I decided to stop taking my hay fever medication. Ah. <laughs> and it, I think I stopped too soon. Yes, and I'm starting probably. to find it a bit of a problem, but um, just felt the need to share that. Well, now let's, um, now, now uh, this this is something that's come from Paul Keane. Paul is uh, an uber fan of Space Nuts and he wants to get all the Space Nuts audience into the Christmas spirit. Are you ready for this, Fred? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, well, that's probably the right answer. Is Paul. Thank you, Paul. Oh my goodness! It's classic. It is. That, speaking of out of the box, yeah, uh, yeah, right out of the, yeah. Um, uh, I love the. Well, it's a ballad, really, isn't it? It's the. It is. Know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> tells yeah. a story. It, it sounds like there was a very sad ending where you got dumped by Santa and couldn't get home. Yeah, but... there was something like that. Yes. But yes. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. That is. Uh, that is wonderful. We appreciate it. Gosh, that's nice. Uh, and I uh, hope you and your family have a wonderful Christmas. And I'd like to send a shout out to all the uh, Space Nuts audience for supporting us. And thank you for um, your uh, constant interest in what Fred and I have to talk about uh, and some of the things that we've done this year. I suppose, Fred, uh, I don't know, story of the year for you. What do you reckon? James Webb Space Telescope. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm, there's been so many. James yeah. Webb Space Telescope, the DART mission. Yeah. That the kind Artemis, of was special. Artemis one. Artemis one. Yeah, uh, yeah I'll know. tell a little factoid that uh, I love, Andrew, is that on the 10th of December, Ingenuity completed its 36th flight on the surface of Mars, exactly wow. 600 days after its first flight. Isn't it brilliant? That's amazing. Fantastic yeah. that it's still going. So there's another thing. I forgot about that, Ingenuity. Yeah. <laughs> um, although that was... Last year, I think it started flying, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, February last year um, when it landed. But it's still going, yep. well past its use-by yeah. date, Five which is flights extraordinary. Five is what they expected. The other thing that's popped up in the last day or so is Insight has yes, sent a message so, saying, yeah. bye-bye, I'm going to sleep, I don't think I can do any more, but I've had a great time and yeah. see you later. Yeah. So that Insight's just about finished. A real tearjerker, that one. Indeed, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, so thank you to uh, everybody for listening and supporting us, especially our patrons on Patreon and Supercast who have um, put their money into Space Nuts uh, as, as a gesture of goodwill. We, we are forever grateful. Also, thank you to our podcasting platforms, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Ditcher, Gosh, I don't know how many others who, who carry us, but we are ever thrilled. Um, 
I wish I could remember them all, but there are so many. And uh, just our, our sponsors in general who've been supporting us for a few years now. That is, uh, that is wonderful. Uh, and we we so much appreciate it. So uh, thank you, and a special thank you to you, Fred, because without you, this, this would be nothing. And um, you know, you, you really are just a fantastic bloke, and so oh, thank you. That's nice. easy to work with, and I'm very very grateful to have had you in a, in my professional life for so long. And, well, that's entirely um, reciprocated, Andrew. Because without you, it wouldn't have happened either. So there you go. And I think. Yeah. Um, if I'm counting correctly, I think we are on the brink of starting season eight of Space Nuts. Is that right? I can't. I think yeah, this must I'm have been sure. seven because we've been going for, well, yeah, seven years pretty well. Yeah, it must be. <laughs> We'd be pushing it. I, I honestly haven't done the numbers. Speaking of numbers, I think our download numbers are pushing up around the 30,000 a week mark or something to that effect. That's nice. That's Incredible a, numbers. That's a million and a half a year, which is... Yeah, I think it's something like that. That's um, fabulous. I'll get that's a message fabulous. from Hugh now saying, no, no, that's 30,000 every 10 years. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. So we're nearly at, nearly at 30,000 downloads. Yeah. No, it's it's good. They're good numbers and... You know, and it's all thanks to the audience for supporting us. I think we're either number one or number two in the science section of iTunes very regularly. Lovely. So that is that is just lovely to know. And thank you again. Thank you, Fred. It's time to wrap it up for this year. What we're going to do over the coming weeks is we're going to run some of our uh, probably more significant episodes, not necessarily our favourite ones, but some of them. So James Webb, Artemis, Dart, a few Q&A episodes that will cover us for the next few weeks. Unfortunately, we're not going to be back as soon as I would like, but that's because I've we've got a little holiday and then I've got to go and have something done in hospital, which, you know, I, I can't put off any longer. So that's just going to keep me on the lowdown for a few weeks. But uh, we'll be back late January, early Feb at this stage, all things being equal. But, Fred, um, Merry Christmas to you and Marnie and uh, Happy New Year and thanks for doing what you do. I love it. I know everyone else does. <laughs> and to you too and Judy, Andrew, and your family. Have a great festive season and we'll look forward to catching up in the new year. Maybe beginning of February sounds perfect. <laughs> to be around then. All right, thanks, Fred. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, and from me, Andrew Dunkley, and from Hugh back in the studio, thank you so much for supporting Space Nuts and have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and we look forward to catching up with you in 2023. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.